This lesson deals with the voltage divider rule. You can find these notes in the ECE 201 ebook in chapter 2, starting at page 45. Let me state the voltage divider rule. If I have K resistances hooked in series, then the voltage across the jth element is equal to the voltage V sub S times the resistance R sub J over the sum of the K resistances. Now, why would that be true? Suppose that the rest of the circuit creates a voltage V sub S. Current would have to come out of its plus terminal and back into its minus terminal because these resistances can only absorb power. The voltage across the jth element would be the current through it times the resistance. Let's call this current that flows through these elements I sub S. So I've got the voltage in terms of the current. What I need to do is solve for that current. So let's do Kirchhoff's voltage law. The rise in voltage would equal the drops around the loop. Because the current's flowing in this direction, we'll have a plus and minus, plus and minus, and so on. Because of our definition of Ohm's law using the passive sign convention. So the voltage V sub S is equal to I sub S times R1, I sub S times R2, all the way through I sub S times R sub K. We could pull out that common I sub S, and now we could substitute in for I sub S over here. So V sub J is equal to I sub S times R sub J. Just interchange these two and you have the theorem on the previous page. Let's look at some special cases. Suppose that I just had two resistances, R1 and R2. So the voltage across R1, the voltage across R2. Just using our definition from our previous theorem, it's going to be R1 over R1 plus R2 times V sub S for the voltage V1. For the voltage V2, it would be R2 over R1 plus R2 times V sub S. And again, V sub S is the voltage across the series combination, and these are the resistances in that combination. The denominator is just the sum of the resistances, but the numerator here is the resistance of the voltage that we're interested in solving for. Suppose you have two equal resistances, and you'd have R over R plus R, and you get half, and likewise R over R plus R, and you get half. If you had K resistances, you'd have R K times in the denominator. Let just drop out. So it's independent of the value of the resistance, and that's going to be very handy in designing a lot of circuits. So if you have two resistances and they're equal, it just divides the voltage up equally. If you have five resistances, it divides it up equally again, one-fifth for each resistance. Let's do some examples. Suppose that I've got a 24 volt battery and I've got four resistances in series. 100 ohms, 560, 330, and 220. So the voltage across the 330 ohm resistance is 330 over 100 plus 560 plus 330 plus 220 times the 24 volts. And that turns out to be 6.55 volts. Let's look at another example. Suppose that I want to pick a resistance to force a voltage across the parallel combination here to be 8 volts. So I'm going to solve for this value of resistance to produce an effect. So what is V out? V out is R equivalent voltage divided with 2K. So here's my R equivalent over R equivalent plus 2K. And then I'm going to multiply that by the 10 volts, which is across this series combination of 2K and R equivalent. And I want that to say be 8 volts. So is that possible? Well, let's solve for the resistance R sub X. But algebra here, let's divide by 8 and take the reciprocal of this and put it on your side of the equation. I'll be dividing this R equivalent into R equivalent, which gives me 1, and then 2K divided by R equivalent. This is 1.25, and then subtracting 1 from that, I get 0.25. And now I can do a little bit more algebra here. Let's bring this on the other side of the equation and bring this over here. That's what this is. And 2,000 divided by a quarter is 8,000. So R equivalent needs to be equal to 8,000 ohms. Now, is it possible to put something in parallel with 10K and create 8,000 ohms? The answer is yes, because the parallel combination is always smaller than the smallest of the resistances in parallel. So product over sum needs to be equal to 8,000. Again, a little bit of algebra we need to do here. So let's divide by 8K, bring this on the other side of the equation, and I can bring this on this side as 1 times R sub X, but when I bring it on this side, it's going to be a minus 1 times R sub X. Divide by this, and so we get the value of R sub X is 10K divided by 10K over 8K minus 1. Multiply numerator and denominator by 8K, and I get 10K minus 8K. That turns out to be 40,000 ohms. Now what we just did is uh, very, very common in designing circuits. And so this formula, talk about it just in general or symbolically. The resistance here was equal to R sub Y times R equivalent over R sub Y minus R equivalent. We will remember that as a formula. When two resistors are in parallel, we take the product over the sum. If you know what their value needs to be, then it's the product of what you want it to be 
over the difference. I gotta make sure that we're going down in value so that we don't actually get a negative number here. It is possible to make a negative resistance out of electronic components like an op amp or a transistor. Let's look at another example. Suppose that I have three resistances and I have a voltage source V sub S. I want to solve for the voltage V sub A and V out. Normally, this notation of a circle and a, and a wire indicates that something else is hooked up here. Now, when that's not the case, I'll have to label the current to tell me that that's an open circuit. So putting zero current here implies that there's nothing hooked up here. This is a common configuration for hooking up to an instrument in lab. We have a very, very high resistance on the instrument and virtually draws no current. There are also other kinds of electronic circuits that have these properties too. This configuration has some interesting observations. The current in R1 is also the current in R2 because there's no current in R3. So we could apply the voltage divider rule to this circuit, even though it doesn't look like these resistances are in series, but they are based on the definition of the same current. The voltage here then is R2 over R1 plus R2 times V sub S. Now let's solve for V out. I mentioned earlier that I prefer one form of Kirchhoff's voltage law over another, and here's the reason why. I want to solve for V sub out. So let me just make that the left-hand side of the equation and put everything else on the right-hand side. I'm going to go around the loop counterclockwise to make this a rise in voltage. I'm going to record the drops around the loop. Now, given the current that's here, I have a drop of 0 times R3. But going around the loop this way, I have a rise in voltage of V0. I have a rise in voltage of the current times the resistance, or I could say I have a drop of the negative of the rise. So rise in voltage is V0, and then I see a minus sign. So I'm going to subtract the value of the current times the resistance. Now that was equal to zero, so it doesn't make any difference. But in other problems, we'll have non-zero values. Then plus V sub A. What I've got then is V out is equal to V sub A, and that's just equal to the previous result. What's really happening is because there's no voltage here, this voltage just simply transfers to here. It'll also be a handy way of just looking at a circuit. If you're not sure, doing pure cause voltage law is the safest way to do that. But that's the reason why I, I like to do the first form of Kirchhoff's voltage law. I try to pick my unknown to be a rise in voltage, and I go clockwise or counterclockwise, depending on where that is. There actually is a device that is sold that really is a voltage divider. You've seen these probably every day of your life using any kind of electronic equipment. You turn a knob to change the volume. In most cases, this is a thing called a potentiometer, or POT for short. It's a three terminal device. It either has a shaft that you can rotate, a set screw that you can turn, or a slider that you can slide. They have one thing in common, they have three terminals. I'll label them A, B, and C, and let's define what's inside that box. Between A and C, there is a total resistance of the potentiometer. This is usually stamped on the potentiometer or indicated with some kind of a number code. The resistance between A and B and B and C becomes just some value of fixed resistance once you fix the shaft location or set screw or the slide. And you just think of that really as, as two separate resistors. And so the potentiometer resistance is the sum of R1 plus R2. Let me further define the value of R1 as a fraction of the total resistance. I'm going to use the Greek symbol alpha for that. Alpha is between 0 and 1. So if the pot is rotated with its shaft half the way, I'd have half the resistance of the pot for R1. Or if I had a set screw or, or a slide, it would be likewise moving at half of its possible distance. If the total potentiometer resistance is R1 plus R2, and if I've now assigned a, a symbol to the value of R1, what's the value of R2? Well, let's just solve for it. R2 is then equal to R pot minus alpha R pot, and so I've got one minus. If I was halfway rotated, the value of R2 would be 1 minus a half. If alpha were a quarter, then R2 would be 3 quarters of the pot resistance. So it works that simple. Let's take a look at another application. Suppose that I have a battery here, and I hook up a potentiometer across it, where here is alpha R pot, and here is 1 minus alpha R pot. And then I use that to hook up to some electronic device, say maybe an MP3 player. Now, when I put a certain voltage across the terminals of that device, it's going to draw some current. And we can roughly approximate its behavior as a ratio of the voltage to the current that it takes in. I'm just going to call that R load. Suppose that I have a 12 volt battery here and I need to make a 3 volt battery out of it. Okay, let's call this total resistance here R equivalent. Well, then I've got a voltage divider. 
with r equivalent and 1 minus alpha r pot. Now, what is r equivalent? It's the parallel combination of alpha r pot and r load. But if it turns out that alpha r pot is always much, much smaller than r load, then you could approximate the parallel combination is just alpha r pot. And so our voltage divider then would be alpha r pot over alpha r pot plus 1 minus alpha r pot. Now, when you add these two together, you get back the r pot, the alpha and the minus alpha terms just drop out. And then the r potentiometer drops out. We've got a voltage then that's proportional to the shaft rotation. So you put the shaft in the center, you get half the voltage. Put the shaft a third of the way, you get a third of the voltage. So if you wanted three volts, and you had 12 volts here, you'd make this a quarter. Now, if you can collect the loading effects here, then it's very linear with the rotation of the pot. This is very handy for creating voltages that are smaller than some source. Now, in other words, you don't want to have a lot of different batteries to run a circuit. Just have one and you can step the voltage down using a potentiometer between the battery and the load. These are some examples of the voltage divider rule.